I love making Man of Steel. I actually looked at Man of Steel as a very socially relevant uh, movie. It's like, I look at it, I think, here's a movie, here's a story about some people, a civilization, they lived on a planet, and they used up all the resources, and they destroyed the planet, and they thought the way to solve the problem was just to go get another planet. I mean, that's really a home run if you can make a big, entertaining, action-packed movie that actually has some uh, underlying uh, social significance. Michael Shannon's General Zod is one of the most iconic villains of all time. This is not a judgement being made solely on the criteria of films adapted from comic books either. When Man of Steel first opens, the audience is not introduced to Superman first, but his home world instead. Krypton is not a home world that exists to simply be destroyed for the sake of Superman having a tragic backstory like so many other superheroes. The destruction of this world is crucial to the world building of the story and its characters. Exhausted our natural resources. We may only have a matter of weeks. As a result, our planet's core became unstable. I warned you, harvesting the core was suicide. Throughout his career, Zack Snyder has produced works of art that are ahead of their time, whether due to their relevance to various socio-political topics or trends in entertainment media. And as a result, they age phenomenally well, regardless of how successful or not their initial box office profits are. Man of Steel's opening introduces Krypton as a dying planet with leaders that refuse to acknowledge the very real threat that their malpractice poses to the world's population. As Superman is one of the most popular superheroes of all time, most people are likely to at least have a vague sense that Jor-El and General Zod are probably foes, but in this opening, they both want the same thing, to save Krypton's people. Give me control of the Codex. I will ensure the survival of our race. And if your forces prevail, You'll be the leader of nothing. Then join me. Help me save our race. At the time of recording this video, Greta Thunberg is going viral for her climate and environmental activism. Six years after Man of Steel's release, you can turn the film on and have it ring as more timely and relevant than ever before. These lawmakers, with their endless debates, have let Krypton to ruin. This context matters to make the story better resonate with the audience, and in turn make the destruction of this planet actually feel like a significant loss. We will never see more of this planet, and neither will General Zod or Superman. This self-destructive tragedy by way of ignorant leaders is an important means of connection between Zod and the Kryptonians as a race to the viewers who are all residents of Earth, the very planet that Zod will go on to try to destroy. I think it's all a matter of perspective. Like, if you're an Earthling, you're not gonna like General Zod very much because he's basically willing to wipe you out in order to save his people. But if you're a Kryptonian, you're probably like, wow, that General Zod, he sure is doing the best he can. So it's just a matter of uh, perspective. On Krypton, the genetic template for every being yet to be born is encoded in the registry of citizens. When Kal-El is reunited with his father, or at least a technologically induced echo of him, he learns about the history of Krypton. This does not only include the environmental destruction of the planet, but the way the society adopted forms of population control. Kal was the first natural birth in thousands of years, as the rest of the population had been biologically engineered by the technology of the Codex to fulfill a particular purpose in the planet's infrastructure. Every child was designed to fulfill a predetermined role in our society, as a worker, a warrior, a leader. While the Codex is first introduced at the beginning of the film, before we ever see Henry Cavill's Superman, it's another important part of understanding Zod's motivations and the larger world-building mythology of Krypton's society. It offers the audience an understanding of the philosophies that existed on Krypton that shaped the social norms of its inhabitants, including General Zod. And he will be free. Free to forge his own destiny. Heresy! The nature versus nurture debate is the ongoing academic concept about whether things like behavior and patterns of thinking are formed as a result of a person's genetic makeup or a person's environment that they experience and learn from. Zod comes from a society that normalizes a colder, more clinical approach to key aspects of life, such as producing offspring and assigning occupations. Though he's not shown as a child, inferences can be made about what type of person he already had a propensity to be based on 
on his genetic makeup, as the Codex would have predetermined his position as a high-ranking military officer before he had even been born. Presumably, there would have also been extensive training to teach him about things like weapons, how to fight, and other skills that would help him thrive in a life of combat and warfare. Zod makes repeated reference to Krypton's manner of breeding, with no amount of disdain for this system. He has no real reason to question it either, as it's what he's always known, and that system is not something he sees as the inherent cause of the destruction of his planet. I exist only to protect Krypton. I was bred to be a warrior, Cal. That is the sole purpose for which I was born. Trained my entire life to master my senses. The best hero and villain combinations are the ones that have the right differences with one another that allow the audience to better understand each side of the argument and overall enrich the story through their philosophical differences. As far as nature versus nurture goes, Zod and Cal's commonality is that they're of the same species, but the environments in which they've grown up are completely different from one another. Cal has been adopted by parents that supported him emotionally and instilled a sense of empathy. It's not to say that all Kryptonians lack empathy, but since Zod and his few remaining followers are all of the same militant background, the contrast is made abundantly clear. The fact that you possess a sense of morality, and we do not, gives us an evolutionary advantage. It's ironic for Zod and his band of Kryptonians to have such a superiority complex. They claim that they're of a higher genetic breed, both within the Kryptonian race and compared to the human race, and even go so far as to reference evolution. And if history has proven anything, it is that evolution always wins. But evolution is a naturally occurring phenomenon. Zod reacts to Jor-El saying that Cal was born naturally and will get to choose his own path in life by claiming that this is heresy. One might make the argument that the Kryptonians have crafted a heretic approach towards life that defies the natural order of evolution itself. Then again, Kryptonians might have their own version of Charles Darwin that developed their own take on the theory of evolution that would seem warped in comparison to Earth's. And now I might just be getting needlessly pedantic. Zod and Cal have a similar genetic makeup that differentiates them from the human race, but Cal's supportive upbringing is a key component of him being able to hone his senses, which presents him with an advantage in battle when Zod's sensory apparatus gets damaged. But when this variation is first presented in their respective tolerances to these two different planetary ecologies, what it's truly symbolic of is culture clash. You've spent a lifetime adapting to Earth's ecology, but you never adapted to ours. Those who don't come from a multicultural background and exist in that type of in-betweenness are less likely to understand this layer of the film's story. Zod is a monocultural Kryptonian, born and raised on Krypton, with zero influences from other cultures on how his standards of normality in the various facets of life have developed. Cal, on the other hand, has repeated references made about his place in relation to these two cultures he has connections to. We wanted you to learn what it meant to be human first, so that one day, when the time was right, you could be the bridge between two peoples. Cal embodies the struggle that many multicultural individuals face at one point or another of being part of two or more cultures, yet somehow not fully belonging to them either. Those who are born and raised in the originating cultural location can have a tendency to act as a gatekeeper towards diaspora owning that cultural label as part of their identity. Note how when Zod first speaks about Cal to the humans, he says that Cal is not one of them, implying an emphasis on him being a Kryptonian. When they first meet in person, Cal refers to him just as Zod and is swiftly reprimanded for his lack of formality. I take it you're Zod? General Zod. At this point in the story, Zod is more than willing to overlook this cultural slip-up. Cultures can vary from one another in their emphasis on things like formality and having more hierarchical social constructs with a greater power distance between those higher and lower up in them. In Japanese culture, the words brother and sister are not used the way they are in English. Separate words are used when referencing an older sibling versus a younger sibling. And this linguistic variation between Japanese and English is an extension of the cultural differences between the two, with Japanese culture placing a greater emphasis on things like formality and respect for one's elders or those higher up in the social hierarchy. Though Zod is initially amicable and willing to still be inclusive towards Cal, it's all right, Feora. We can forgive Cal any lapses in decorum. He's a 
stranger to our ways. He is more than prepared to revoke that cultural membership and demean Clark's upbringing as something inferior to what he sees as a pure version of Kryptonian culture. Trained my entire life to master my senses. Where did you train? On a farm? Research has found substantial evidence that cultural factors influence the development and behavior of individuals. In short, people will behave in ways that align with cultural influences and expectations. Acculturation refers to the phenomena which result when groups of individuals having different cultures come into continuous first-hand contact with subsequent changes in the original culture patterns of either or both groups. Psychologist John Barry developed the fourfold model of acculturation which refers to four separate acculturation strategies. Zod would fall under separation as he strongly identifies with his original culture and does not value learning about or making any substantial adaptations to Earth's culture. Jor-El's Echo tries to reason with Zod and make him consider living on Earth without destroying everything on it to recreate Krypton, but Zod ultimately rejects this concept. Our people can coexist so we can suffer through years of pain trying to adapt like your son has? His reaction is understandable based on everything we know about his character. Zod mentions the physical pains of adapting to Earth's ecology the way Cal did as a child, but he's referring to a much deeper set of acculturation stressors than just that. Given the lack of a substantial Kryptonian community, he would not be able to insulate himself the way that he would like to. Additionally, he was already bigoted within his own Kryptonian world, which can be noted through his repeated references to bloodlines and purity. We'll start anew. We'll sever the degenerative bloodlines that led us to this state. Zod is a man trapped by his own rigidity. He is entirely unwilling to change his ways or be open to new experiences. For all his strengths as a general and warrior, his inability to adapt is his greatest detriment. This is why long before his final confrontation with Cal, he's a dead man walking. And I'm arguing its merits with a ghost. We're both ghosts, Zod. Can't you see that? Every part of Zod's characterization is masterfully crafted, all of the thematic material enriches his character and the overall story, but all of these creative ideas would mean nothing without the right performer to breathe life into the character. I'm just speculating, but I think whoever's at the helm of that thing is looking to make a dramatic entrance. Michael Shannon got asked by a lot of reporters during the Man of Steel media tour about stepping into the iconic role of General Zod. Everyone has seen Terrence Stamp's portrayal and originality is dead when it comes to creating questions during these press junkets, but Michael Shannon took it all in good stride and gave full credit to Terrence Stamp. He noted how Stamp's portrayal was scary and that he was concerned with his own ability to be just as scary. But with Zack Snyder being the creative mastermind for this story, he was able to steer Michael Shannon in the right direction. I didn't think I could be that scary and then Zack said, well, you know, it's really not about being scary, it's about being a general and taking your job seriously and you're trying to save your civilization, which is something I think anybody can understand, you know. I kind of just took a different approach and Try not to think too much about what happened before you. Know. General Zod is an incredibly rich character. He is not merely there to be adversarial, nor is he only defined by so-called objectively bad attributes. He's strong, clever, and incredibly resourceful. Trying to save your entire race from destruction, only to be sent out into space and awakened to find almost everyone gone, is an incalculable trauma to face. Yet he leads his followers to retrofit the various scraps they can find in space to carry on for 33 years in search of a way to save their people, even when the odds make it seem like an impossible task. And so the instrument of our damnation became our salvation. Michael Shannon had both an excellent script and the guidance of a creative genius, but ultimately he is the one that delivered such a powerful performance. Everyone already knows that he can serve a menacing intensity better than practically anyone, but what he doesn't get enough credit for is infusing the precise amount of emotional depth and nuance into the character. Bad guys, a lot of people think, well, they're the easiest ones to play. They're the, also the easiest ones to play badly. You get to do the dance, and I think that, that, that Michael plays it as a leading man. He, he owns the space that he's on, and I think that a lot of times we associate character actors sometimes like not having the weight of lead actors is simply not true. It carries it like a lead. 
Even with all of General Zod's simmering rage and xenophobic philosophies, Michael Shannon shows these beautiful moments that offer a glimpse into the deepest parts of this character. This is someone who all but never allows anyone to see him be vulnerable. It's only when he's alone or no one's looking, or when he's lost it all that these parts of himself are able to surface. I know this sounds weird because he is technically the villain, but everything he's doing is from the heart. You killed him. I did. And not a day goes by where it doesn't haunt me. And every action I take, no matter how violent, or how cruel, <laughs> is for the greater good of my people. That line in particular is one that deserves so much credit. For him to explicitly describe his actions as violent and cruel is indisputable proof that he has a level of self-awareness that so few villains show. It's commonly stated in the discourse surrounding works of fiction that every villain is a hero in his own mind. But Zod's moral compass is not quite as skewed as a lot of oversimplified writing for villains tends to be. And now, I have no people. My soul. That is what you have taken from me. The despair of General Zod in this moment is stunning to watch. The fact that he can do so many terrible things and yet Michael Shannon can still make you empathize with this character in this moment shows just how superb of an actor he is. A good death is its own reward. At this point in the film, it's already been established that Zod will not survive this conflict with Superman. Zod's identity is not only wrapped up in his Kryptonian heritage, but being a warrior. A parallel I've all but never seen drawn is from the character of General Zod to Colonel Nathan Hardy. A good death is its own reward. They have their causes that they believe in, and they're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for them. Make no mistake, Zod puts up one hell of a fight in this battle against Cal. He is in pain and lashes out as a result. I'm going to make them suffer, Cal. These humans you've adopted, I will take them all from you one by one. But Zod, having lost everything, knows that there is no place for him in this world, or any other for that matter. He already made it clear to Jor-El that he will not consider trying to make a new life here if the world stays as it is. And as a warrior, he wants to go out on his sword, so to speak. There's only one way this ends, Cal. Either you die, or I do. Zod is highly intelligent. He has sized up his opponent and knows exactly what type of person Cal is. He's seen into his mind and is well aware of the empathy he has for the people of Earth. When Cal tries to pull Zod out into space where their combat will not cause human casualties, Zod smacks him back down to Earth. If you love these people so much, you can mourn for them. Zod has already demonstrated that he has no problem causing harm to the human species. He was prepared to decimate the entire planet's population. Cal begging for Zod to stop is futile because Zod has already made up his mind and established his pattern of behavior. But I would also note that Zod seems to be moving awfully slowly in getting his laser eyes towards these potential victims. Even in his final moments, he forces Cal's hands to go out on his own terms, never to wait from his cause or his principles. Hi everyone, it's Lady Genevieve. Thank you so much for watching my video about Michael Shannon's General Zod. The topic of this video was actually one that was voted on by my viewers. I posted a poll in my community tab for people to pick a topic for a video for me to do in the month of September. Man of Steel ended up winning that poll. Now I am aware of the fact that some of the people who might have voted for that topic would have presumed that if I was going to do a video about that film that I would talk more about Superman. But here's the thing. If I had done a video about the film in its entirety and attempted to just make General Zod a section of that video, the video would have ended up being about an hour long and nobody wants to watch an hour long video from me. So I opted to take a different approach. If you would like to vote for a video topic for the month of October, the poll for that is still currently open. I definitely will not be able to start working on that video until after I get back from New York Comic Con, which I am going to be leaving for in just a couple of days and I'm really stressed out about it just because I know that I need to get this video done beforehand. Also be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram and Letterboxd and Vero. Yeah, why not? I don't post on there 
quite as often, but I will say that if I have something to post that's related to the DCEU, I usually make sure that I post about it on there as well. It's a good way to keep up with my running commentary of my favorite films and series. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and leave a comment. I worked really hard on it. Not because people were demanding it, but because I really love Michael Shannon's General Zod. You know, when I met Zack at his charity event, one of the times that I talked to him, I did feel compelled to say that I really love Michael Shannon's General Zod and that it's just one of the greatest villain performances ever. Zack agreed, naturally, because he knows what taste is. He more or less said something to the effect of, oh yeah, he's awesome. And I agree, Michael Shannon's General Zod is awesome. So that'll be it for this video. See you in the next one. Bye.